So welcome to everybody uh, to this webinar. And we'll be talking about innovations in concrete pavements. Uh, my name is Brett Trotman. I work for the Missouri DOT. And uh, I am the chairperson of the rigid team that is actually part of the National Road Research Alliance uh, that we commonly refer to as the NRRA. And uh, that is the association entity that's actually hosting this event today. Uh, the original plan was to have this presentation given during the NWRA pavement conference that would have been held last month, about the third week in May. But as uh, all of us are fully aware with the pandemic and, uh, and safety concerns, it was decided that we would not have that face-to-face -face meeting in May. But we thought the topics were still of vital interest to everybody that we would do it this way. So this is one of the topics that was going to be presented during that NWRA payment conference. And hopefully, if you're not familiar with the NWRA, it is a, a pool fund. It currently has 10 entities in it. It has eight states. We have the Illinois Tollway and the Minnesota Local Roads all as part of members. We have well over 50 associate members, which are comprised of academia, a lot of different industry representatives and suppliers of materials. And we all work together to develop research needs and actually get to build projects, which is the fun part. Uh, a lot of the projects have been built at uh, Min Road, but there are a few satellite sites scattered throughout. So it's not just exclusively a Min Road field. If you can do projects outside of that venue, although that is a tremendous venue to have available to us. And uh, if you want more information on that, you can go to the website, just type in National Road Research Alliance and you'll see all the information, all the different teams and such that are involved with that. Again, welcome you to the webinar. And uh, just a little housekeeping, all the participants are gonna be muted, but that doesn't mean you cannot have the opportunity to ask questions. In the upper right-hand corner, you'll see a little thing that says Q&A. Throughout the whole presentation, feel free to type in any questions you have. And then when the speaker finishes the presentation, uh, I will read the questions and allow the speaker a chance to answer, and hopefully there'll be plenty of time to answer all the questions. And uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to introduce Peter Taylor. And, uh, it's my privilege to do that. I've known Peter for well over 10 years, and uh, he's a very, very knowledgeable individual and a, and a good speaker, so I'm looking forward to hearing the information today. Peter Taylor is the director of the National Concrete Pavement Technology Center at Iowa State University. He is involved in conducting projects and programs investigating materials-related aspects of concrete pavements. He also spends time helping agencies and contractors implement best practices in concrete pavement design, construction, and maintenance. His research is focused on developing mixtures that are engineered to meet the requirements of the environment that they'll be served in. Uh, he is a registered professional engineer in the state of Illinois and is involved with numerous professional societies. With that, it's my privilege to introduce Peter Taylor, and uh, I'm going to hand it over to you, Peter. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Brad. I appreciate the, uh, the introduction and uh, the opportunity to have a little fun, talk about where we've come from, what we're doing now, and in some ways, a little vision on where we think we can go next in the idea of uh, concrete pavements. I did another presentation a couple of weeks ago and the lead slide was concrete hasn't changed in the last 150 years, except, except it has an enormous amount. And that's the thought process I want us to keep uh, working on. So uh, I'll be addressing some of the innovations, changes in materials, paving systems, design, construction specifications and maintenance. It's a fairly long list. It's a lot of material to cover. I'll be talking really fast. Hopefully there'll be a few uh, tall stories and uh, we can make this fairly entertaining. Feel free to throw questions at Brett and uh, we'll try and address some of them as we move along. The photograph is a strip road, sort of road that I actually learned to drive on in the heart of Central Africa, where in order to, main to minimize the amount of material being used, they just laid down the two wheel paths and didn't bother about the rest of the pavement. It was always entertaining when you had oncoming traffic because both of you had to get off. And uh, in this situation where this photograph was taken, it would be kind of entertaining. But for very low traffic applications, it worked really well. All right, 
so in terms of the materials, again, what is concrete? It's the cementitious, the reactive materials, the aggregates, the admixtures, and all the other things that we can throw in there. Once again, I learned a lot of my early te concrete technology on construction sites, just like this one. Fairly small mixer, normally uh, petrol powered, uh, in a place where Unemployment was high, so people were cheap and machines were expensive. So instead of fancy way batches, we had guys counting shovel loads going into the mixer for your mix proportioning, piles of materials lying around, wheelbarrows is the primary form of transportation. <coughs> and uh, it's actually remarkable how abuser friendly concrete is, is that we could still make high quality concrete using systems like this. So let's go back in time. Early cements, the, they're saying that the, the Egyptians were building lime-based structures 6,000 years ago. Often when we talk about the history of concrete, the story is often started with uh, the Eddystone, Eddystone Lighthouse on the uh, east coast of England. And this was a lime-based system. So you take calcium carbonate, you heat it up, you get calcium hydroxide, calcium oxide, mix it with a bit of water and you get calcium hydroxide. Uh, and that you can, it, it will set and harden and over time it carbonates back to calcium carbonate. So you go through the full cycle. But with that carbonation, it uh, becomes fairly strong and rigid. And that uh, lighthouse survived a couple of hundred years as a masonry structure held together the lime-based cement. The other product that's been around forever are the natural pozzolans, the stuff that comes out of the top of volcanoes. It is silica-based. It is a very good natural pozzolan. The term comes from a city in Italy uh, where they did a lot of their structures built using uh, natural vol volcanic material. My father-in-law used to give me a very hard time pointing to photographs like this and saying, well, the Romans knew how to make buildings that lasted forever. Why can't you? And uh, indeed, this structure, the Duomo in Rome, was built using not natural pozzolanic materials, and it has lasted forever. It's a very beautiful, strong, stable structure. Uh, but the materials that we have available to us today in the sort of quantities that we need them uh, are not quite the same stuff. And that's what keeps uh, concrete te technologists employed. 1824, uh, a British mason found that if he took limestone and a bit of clay and he cooked it up in a fire, and ground it up, he could make what he called artificial stone. And he actually patented that process. Um, now, the term Portland is because this artificial stone that he created reminded him of the color of the rocks, of the natural rocks from the Isle of Portland where he grew up. So the term has actually got nothing to do with the chemistry. It is just a bit of whimsy by Joseph Ashton. The photograph is a, another story whether or not it's true but it's an ent entertaining story anyway early days cement was transported in barrels and uh, there was a ship coming uh, near the mouth of the thames river on the east side of england and the ship got in trouble and sank and uh, a whole bunch of barrels floated out from the hold and the local People saw this ship in trouble, they saw the barrels coming out and they figured those barrels are probably full of alcohol of some form and they got excited and they all took their boats out and they swam out and they rescued all of these barrels, brought them ashore thinking there was going to be one hell of a party and were kind of disappointed to discover that uh, the barrels had no alcohol, they had cement in them. Uh, and because the barrels were not watertight, they got water in them and the cement actually set. But notwithstanding, they weren't going to waste anything. They built a pub out of these cement barrels. And that pub apparently 
still is open and operating. Uh, and one day I want to go there. So again, the versatility of Zeeman Tisha's systems keeps us going. Early days, uh, cement kilns got a lot more efficient than the vertical kilns. Um, but, and they were using a wet slurry. Therefore, the kilns had to be fairly long, a lot of energy going into drying out the system before they could actually start the clinkering process. Modern kilns were using uh, vertical uh, stacks, heat exchange towers that uh, are a lot more efficient with the heat. The kiln itself is a lot wider, a lot shorter. The energy recovery is a lot more efficient. And so we're reducing the amount of energy that it's taken taking to do that clinkering process. And this is fairly typical of a modern day kiln. One thing to be aware of is that cement chemistry is changing and has been for a long time. Back in the 20s and 30s, there was about an equal proportion of C3S and C2S. Now that's mind blowing, boring chemical stuff that you don't really care about, except that you do. The red curve, the C3S is the stuff that is hydrates very quickly. It delivers early day, early setting and early day strength gain. C2S is the stuff that gives us the longer term performance. And then, again, old fashioned cements, it was about equal. And that's why we originally had 28 days requirement for curing, because you had to give the C2S plenty of opportunity to kick in. Nowadays, in responding to demands for cements that gain strength a lot faster, Industry is tweaking that, continually changing it. So the faster portion of it is increasing and the slower portion is decreasing, um, which has a couple of interesting effects. One, old fashioned cements would not have worked well with supplementary cementing materials. Modern cements are actually dependent on fly ash, slag, silica fume, and those products to get the chemistry right because uh, of this change in in balance between C3S and C2S. And so we start moving into the idea of regularly, if not always using fly ash, slag, natural pozzolans like medicale and silica fume. And they're taking advantage in, the ch in their change of chemistry and they're delivering good strengths and better permeability, better durability, the ability to resist alkali silica reaction, uh, sulfate attack is because we are, we're able to put these materials into our mixtures. What's proving challenging is that with changing economics and practices, fly ash is getting harder and harder to get a hold of. And so we're having to start looking to be a little bit more imaginative on what other materials can we use. There is a supply of natural pozzolan of Medicaid just north of the Minnesota border. Uh, it, uh, I'm not sure that it's being exploited right at the moment, but the economics may start to work out that this stuff may actually start to become worthwhile. It works very effectively. It's a, it's a very good uh, pozzolanic material. It gives us almost silica fume performance without some of the disadvantages. So our modern cements need supplementaries and the real art is finding the right product and using them in the right quantities. Are there other products out there? Are there other burned materials, other ashes that we can use in our concrete? To date, we haven't looked at those very hard because fly ash and slag have been abundant. But now uh, we may need to start revisiting some of those questions. What other gray powders are out there? And what do we have to do to measure them to reassure ourselves that they're gonna be effective in our concrete materials? The other wrinkle is that we're starting to put limestone up to about 15% limestone that hasn't been through the kiln, but is added at the grinding mill. And uh, the data is showing us it's performing pretty well. In fact, <coughs> with some fly ashes, uh, the, the, limest uh, the limestone actually reacts on a separate re uh, reaction uh, to give us some synergistic benefits. So we're getting increased early and later strengths and properties uh, with some of the high sea ash uh, materials reacting with the limestone. The joy of this is that it save, saves costs and it also reduces the CO2 footprint because we're not decomposing the limestone in the kiln. Uh, it, 
and so it's staying as a calcium carbonate in the system on its way through the mill. Uh, so many agencies are starting to uh, permit the use of this material. From a sustainability point of view, that's a very good point uh, thing to do. Other cements are starting to uh, attract attention. Calcium sulfur aluminum cements have been around forever. They're the heart of rapid set products. Um, commercially available around the country, most commonly used in California, uh, <clears throat> but we are seeing them all over the place. High alumina cements uh, were common in the UK in the 50s and 60s, uh, but there were some technical challenges with them. If we handle those correctly, they're very effective. Geopolymers, the idea of mixing um, alkalis with fly ash and getting some sort of cementitious reaction out of them, again, technically, can be very effective. The market hasn't really taken off with these products, but they are commercially available. And then magnesium phosphate cements uh, can work very effectively, particularly for things like overnight patches, where you've got to get traffic back on there very early on. So again, we're starting to, or continuing to look at alternative cementitious systems uh, for particular applications. But for regular slip form, and uh, hand placing concrete uh, regular Portland cement with the supplementary is tough to beat economically and performance wise. One of the ways that we're starting to look at uh, dealing with the shortage of fly ash is the idea of reclaiming stuff that's been put into stockpiles. There's a lot of it. The industry is telling us there's at least a billion tons of the material out there. Larry Sutter is very involved in uh, Looking at this, he's actually written a tech brief for us, and we'll be publishing that as soon as we can get it through the review process on what's required and how do we go about uh, pulling fly ash out of the ground, what do we have to do to treat it to make sure that it's good, and how do we test it to reassure ourselves that it is good, getting it into the market. Uh, again, one of the challenges with this is the transportation distances. The moment you haul this stuff any great distance, the cost of the transport starts to eat up its value. As I said, SEMs for other industries are starting to look more and more interesting as flash becomes difficult to get. Wide open field, a lot of interest for us to keep looking at that activity. I was on a, a, a research needs uh, task group yesterday with a group of colleagues in Iowa, and this topic of uh, alternative Alternatives to fly ash came to the top of the pile as an urgent research need. On the aggregate side, uh, again, as virgin materials get a little harder to get hold of, one of the things that sun sources are starting to look at is uh, crushed rock instead of gravels. Now, other places are very familiar with this. Again, where I grew up in Johannesburg, the only ag fine aggregate we had was crushed. And so for me, it's, it's not something that's scary, but for some agencies, it makes their hair stand on end. It's a little different. You have to treat it a little differently. The workability is different. The strengths are actually better. Uh, the durability is much the same. Uh, so uh, again, we know how to accommodate those. We just need to train operators on, on how to get around it. The need to understand and uh, deal with ASR and decracking is, is never ending at that work. Continues. The other big one that's starting to rise is this, the idea of recycling concrete as aggregate, at least in the base, if not in, into the new concrete system. And uh, again, quite a lot of guidance is available. CP Tech Center has published a couple of documents. We're working on a couple more right at the moment. So this is increasing. For me, the biggest issue, again, is quality control. If you know where the aggregate's coming from, then it's pretty easy to do an operation like the one in the photograph. Uh, but if you're in a city where you're getting all sorts of stuff being dumped at a, at a dump, uh, quality control can become entertaining. Admixtures, again, this is an old photograph stolen from PCA. We're used to the idea of admixtures for workability, controlling setting, and putting air into the system. There are many products out there for controlling the workability of the mixture, providing corrosion inhibitors inhibition and uh, waterproofers. The field is wide open. My only commentary on this is these are good things. They do good things for us. But as a concrete geek, I would still say, don't use products like this to fix bad concrete. 
make good concrete and then make it fabulous by putting these materials into it. Don't try and make a bad mixture better by doping it with, it, with chemicals. We're starting to grow uh, in our knowledge and application of the idea of putting fibers into our mixtures. We photograph the two different locations. One is in Minnesota, a traffic circle just north of Sleepy Eye in the heart of middle of nowhere, Minnesota. Uh, the, the, the circle itself has no joints in it. There are no joints for sawn. We are involved in tracking and monitoring uh, the formation of cracks and there is a, a report on the construction in the first couple of years of uh, monitoring on the NRRA website uh, and that systems work pretty well. What we have found is that the cracks have opened up a fair amount and where the cracks have got bigger than about a millimeter the load transfer is starting to fall off. The photo on the right is a pavement that we built in northern Iowa right up on the Minnesota border. The uh, county engineer agreed to let us put in 600 yards of uh, pavement with a fair amount of fiber in it and no joints. Uh, again, it's cracked naturally at about 60 feet spacing. Thus far, the joints aren't too wide. We're keeping an eye on it. I'm trying to persuade the DOT to run some load transfer tests on that section. Just again, just to keep an eye on, see if we can correlate uh, how much the cracks open up with uh, the no transfer capabilities, but uh, this was an overlet. The, uh, the county engineer is really happy. He doesn't have any joints that he has to maintain, which is altogether a good thing. So again, the use and benefits of fly ash in jointed and unjointed systems is uh, another wide open field. Uh, dowels. Again, if we're looking for load transfer, dowels are a very good thing. I contacted Mark Snyder, who's the real expert in this field, and said, I need one slide on dowels. Uh, he sent me 90, said I was stupid to try and keep it any less than that. So I pulled it down to three slides. Between us, we agreed on these three slides. One is regular dowels, uh, steel with some sort of coating on them, uh, whether that coating is paint, the, the green material we've been used to, the newfangled purple and gray products, FRP, multi-layer, the technology is growing to help us keep these things from corroding. We've also using non uh, st uh, plain steel dowels with GFRP, stainless steel, composites, combinations of materials. And then we're also looking at dowels that aren't just round bars, but tubes or elliptical or flat plates, whether they're football shaped or diamond shaped, egg shaped. Uh, flat dowels. These flat ones are actually great for very thin sections and have a lot of uh, potential in that field. In fact, I think there was one test section put into uh, Moon Road with plate dowels. Uh, so if you want to know more about that, uh, contact Tom Burnham and I'll talk to you about how those are performing. The other technology that I'm reasonably excited about is this idea of internal curing. We nag our contractors and we whine about the need for curing, but traditional curing systems, whether it's flooding, sprays, burlap, or curing compounds only really affect the surface of the concrete. Therefore, the idea of putting little spheres or pellets of material into the heart of the concrete that don't affect the water cement ratio, but continue to deliver water back out into the concrete as it dries out, um, technically it has a lot of solid basis uh, and uh, quite a lot of work has been done. It, it's a no-brainer for bridge decks. I know uh, New York, I think Texas have adopted us and I think Kansas has done a few uh, of bridge decks. Iowa has built a few and found them to be pretty effective. Um, and we've done two test sections in Iowa using uh, thin overlays. Where I'm excited about it is that it, when you haven't got the differential of drying, then the warping goes down. So your vertical movements get reduced fairly significantly. The two test sections we've done, um, the data so far is indicating that the vertical deformation of these slabs is about a, uh, well under half that of the control sections, which means uh, the risk of early bending and cracking has gone down significantly. 
that on top of the reduced permeability is huge. The catch with uh, the way we're doing it at the moment <coughs> is that uh, handling the material to provide the internal curing uh, can be a challenge. Here's a photograph of two different systems. Uh, in the US, the standard approach to doing internal curing is lightweight fine aggregate. The little black dots in this core sample are the lightweight fine aggregate. You pre-soak it before you put it in the mixture and that water becomes available for curing through the depth of the section over time. Um, the catch being is that for bridge decks, it's not a lot of material, it's pretty easy. For pavements, Maintaining a stockpile that's got enough pre-soaked material for a full day's work, two days of work, because you've got to pre-soak it for two days, can be kind of interesting. But uh, we did it for a couple of short sections. The contractor didn't complain too much. Uh, and if it's going to help us with the warping and cracking, uh, I think it may still be worthwhile. The alternative is to look at superabsorbent polymers. So the stuff on the left is functionally kitty litter. The stuff on the right is functionally the stuff we get in diapers, a little plastic spheres that absorb water and give them back. This is very common application in Europe. Hasn't found a lot of mileage in the US yet. Again, we're trying to find funding to investigate these a little bit more. What we may be able to do is to throw them into the concrete uh, dry and let them soak water out of the mixture so you don't have the stockpiling issues. You can treat them more like an admixture than an aggregate. So. No, Illinois Tollway is looking at that. I believe Iowa DOT may be pushing forward an idea to, to research this a little bit in the future. But I think there's some uh, great potential for both of these applications. Does it work? Absolutely. Uh, this is work from a project we did in Ohio, a bridge deck that we built. Uh, the control system was their conventional mix. The test system we put in Fairly high dosage of slag. We limited the water cement ratio uh, to 0.45. We limited the total paste content, the binder content in the system to a moderate amount. And we packed in a fair amount of the internal curing lightweight aggregate system. After 18 months, uh, the, the control deck had fairly significant cracking, as you can see with the red stripes here, while the control deck had two very minor cracks in it. It works. We can we can build crack-free bridge decks uh, with current technology. We've just got to apply this and get it done. Uh, Dan Miller did a presentation for PCA a couple of weeks ago on this, and I believe they're thinking about doing another test section, uh, test bridge. Um, and as I said, New York is doing this. This is their standard system now. Not a control crack. You can do this. The other innovation is the idea of putting ge geotextiles down, particularly when you're looking at uh, overlays, is that if you're having an unbounded overlay, you're trying to separate the two layers in order to prevent reflection. Uh, the geotextile does a very effective job of keeping the two layers separate. Uh, it also helps a lot with drainage, as long as you daylight the fabric out to some sort of drainage system, either it's daylight into the uh, the air or into a drainage system. Uh, the caveat with this is that there have been reports on quite a lot of movement, but uh, that has, uh, uh, we still got to investigate that one and, and get the real details. Many agencies are actually starting, and I think Brett, you're one of those that is preferring to use geotextiles instead of asphalt as the interlayer because it has no risk of stripping. Um, so, uh, is more likely to be stable in the long term. <clears throat> so there's still a little bit of work needed on this, but uh, many agencies have adopted this and seem to be pretty happy in terms of cushioning and preventing um, <clears throat> reflective cracking. And then my own passion, proportioning. Photograph is from a 1916 edition of PCA's Design and Control, the Bible of American Concrete. And in big letters, a one, two, four mixture for concrete walls, flabs, pavements, beams. Uh, my experiences when I, again, first started practicing structural concrete was a one, two, four. If you had other concrete like sidewalks, it was one, three, six. I heard the other day, uh, I was noodling around preparing for this presentation that uh, 
one of the old um, granitoid sections in Minnesota, the mixed proportions were one, three, four. Uh, so relatively little cement in the system. Although they did report that cause from the granitoid section with those proportions is that consolidation wasn't great. So there probably wasn't enough paste in the system to get full work, to make it workable enough to be able to consolidate it properly. But uh, yeah, I'm not joking. One, two, four was a very regular type of uh, mixed proportion. Since then, we've moved to ACI 211, which is a linear process. Um, and it worked very effectively. It was a great process for um, pre-computer days. Uh, and so there was a certain amount of guesswork. Uh, and so it, it, it was very effective. It works gr very well for pa uh, structural concrete, not so well for paving concrete, it tends to over sand the mixtures that we produce. And so we have worked at trying to think about this a little bit differently. And the approach that I'm recommending is the idea of consider the aggregate as basically a filler. And what the real part you have to worry about is how can we get the gradation right to get as much aggregate in there as is good. I wouldn't say as much as possible because too much aggregate is actually not ideal. Um, <coughs> then we start to think about the gray part, which is the glue. And we can consider the two issues we have to think about with that glue is um, what sort of glue do we want? Do we want Elmer's kindergarten glue or do we want Gorilla glue to hold this thing hold together? And then how much glue? We want to fill up all the spaces between the aggregate. We also want to separate the aggregate particles so that there is glue in between them holding them together when it's hardened. And also that glue acts as a, a lubricant so we get workability when it's in the fresh state. And a large part of what we did um, was trying to figure out that question of how much. The other part to remember whenever you're doing mixed proportioning is as you adjust any one of these three things, it's a bit like a Rubik's cube. You change one thing, everything else changes. So it's kind of pointless to have a linear process. You want to have an iterative system that as you change things, it can cycle through the calculation over and over until you reach a balance point. The other part with proportioning is traditionally we've been brainwashed into thinking that more cement meant better concrete. This is not true. Uh, and I know that's heresy, but I have plenty of data to support that thought. On the horizontal axis, the properties that we're really looking for in concrete, particularly for pavements, but it, these thoughts apply to any form of concrete, whether it's structural, RCC, SCC, bridges, dams, whatever. We have to worry about the workability. It has to be appropriate for the system we're working with. We have to worry about permeability, keep the de-icing salts and other aggressive fluids out of the system. Yes, it has to be strong enough. In cold places like Minnesota, Iowa, uh, Missouri, well, Missouri is not so cold, but cold enough, we worry about cold weather. We worry about shrinkage, particularly in the hot, dry places. The states uh, in the, de the, the desert states. Shrinkage for them is the key issue, not cold weather. And for all of us, we worry about ASR decrack. And when you look at the aggregate system, this part of the, the, the equation, it affects the workability and it affects the aggregate stability and only has a marginal effect on all the other properties. Likewise, when we look at the quantity of the glue, down here, the paste quantity, it affects workability, it negatively affects shrinkage, and the other effects are pretty marginal. The part we have to pay attention to is the quality of our glue. The air void system, the water cement ratio, the SCM type and dosage, those are the levers we can pull to make really great concrete that control, transport, strength, cold weather resistance, influence workability and shrinkage, and aggregate stability. Highlighted yellow row is the one that we really have to pay attention to. And those are the ones that the specifiers have control over. Spec should have limitation on how much air you put into the system. What's the minimum water cement ratio you need to pay attention to? How much supplementaries you want to put into the mix? And Minnesota has led the way on that. It was uh, Doug Schwartz that first led the charge. Water cement ratio 0.4 or else. 
and got it. And, and uh, Maria has uh, carried on with that uh, uh, legacy. And it's been a very good thing for their concrete. Again, this whole process of paying attention to how much paste, getting enough, but not too much, does it work? Uh, this is a, a, a site in Pennsylvania. In 2017, they built the section on the left with their standard mix. Through the winter of 2017, the contractor and I did a lot of fooling around, trial batches, computer number crunching. This is what they built in 2018. Not a flaw in sight. And we actually cut cement out of this mixture. His mix was quite a lot cheaper. Uh, it says he saved a lot of money. I asked him for 1%. Uh, the check hasn't arrived yet. <clears throat> All right. Those are the materials. What about the paving systems? We can form it. We can slip form it. We can do other things. Forming is great for small portions. Uh, again, if you really want to employ people and f uh, form concrete, not a bad way to go for odd shapes and small sections. Slip forming is if you've got to cover miles. What's intriguing is that this photograph has far fewer people in it, and yet they seem to be covering an awful lot of distance. Uh, and so it's fast, it's familiar. We, we've learned how to do a really good job, and my thanks to Angela Folkstad for this photograph coming out of uh, Colorado. RCC is an interesting alternative. Uh, zero slump, no forms needed, no reinforcing steel, no joints, no finishing. The catch with it is uh, the surface is not ideal for high speed applications, except in Missouri, where they've done a test section where they've put uh, an admixture on the surface where they've been able to get a finish on it for a high speed application. And one day we need to get Brad up on this session to uh, talk about how that test section is working. Uh, the interesting thing about it for me is that it can take light traffic immediately. I live in a cul-de-sac. My neighbors are grumpy old professors and they refuse or they push back at the city really hard. We have an asphalt pavement right outside my house and it burns me every day when I drive to work. I've harassed the city engineer and he said, the only reason we haven't replaced it with concrete is that your neighbors won't let us shut the road down for three days. And I'm thinking RCC would be great. We could get in there, get it down to the base layer um, we could still drive on that base layer overnight if it doesn't rain. The next day they could come in and do an RCC. Um, and again, I could drive home to my, onto my driveway overnight. The RCC will take domestic traffic immediately. And then later on, we can figure out how we're going to do a finish on top of the surface. I'm still pushing the city engineer. He hasn't given in yet. but We'll keep pushing. The other interesting technology, it's not new, but it's finding good applications in places where lane rentals are high. If you've got to get back on the road first thing in the morning because of the traffic, precast is a really interesting approach. You get quality control at the plant. Uh, you get all the shrinkage and the drying and the curing done before the concrete even arrives on the construction site. So all you're doing is digging out the old stuff, leveling the surface, putting the new one down, and uh, sealing it up. It's in the the Illinois Tollway have adopted this for the inside lane of their, all of their repairs because they were having a, a horrible time with the incursions. Is that motorists were not paying attention and entering the construction site and messing up the new concrete pavement. Minnesota's had their own fair share of those in the last couple of years. These things are insensitive to that. So uh, there, there is a great opportunity for this. We're, we'll be producing some guidance documents on this topic the next couple of years. Design, long, long ago, rule of thumb. I built it in six inches. I will continue to build it in six inches. We got sophisticated and did the Ashton 93 based on the, the road test section in Illinois. But the point to pick up here is that design is more than just thickness. It's all the details that go into the pavement as well. Since then, Ashto, pavementdesigner.org, BCOA, there is all sorts of design tools. Uh, and again, we could spend 90 minutes on this topic. There is a recording of a webinar we ran uh, about a month ago, uh, where all of this is, is discussed in quite a lot of detail. So design is moving on. It's changing. We're getting better at it. And then the whole art of uh, how do we handle this stuff? 
digging up old photographs of old construction sites. This photograph on the left is really intriguing. Steel toe boots, hard hats, uh, reflective gear, hype, really fascinating. You know, Osho would have a complete hissy fit if they saw this image. Um, the lighting is also intriguing. I don't know how it's been touched up, but it's, it's a great image of the way things used to be. And again, the volumes of concrete when everybody is manhandling it by wheelbarrow, not going to happen. Small mixes, uh, this picture I stole from Dave Howard um, of hauling the materials by rail built along the side of the pavement. Nowadays, we do things a little differently. We haul premix the stuff, we haul in a flat in a flatbed truck and dump it in front of the paver. For smaller operations and city operations, we use ready mix, and for really small sections, we use volumetric uh, equipment. Again, bigger trucks, we haul a lot more material around, we can build faster. Early age pavers, again, some really cool old photographs of uh, the imaginative way that these smart people did with the equipment that they had available. Uh, it's, it's quite astounding. This is the first recorded slip form paver uh, in, the Iowa, in Iowa in the 1950s. Last seen, I think, somewhere in the north, northern part of the state near Clear Lake. Um, uh, again, a couple of local guys got smart and built their own paver. Nowadays, we're building huge, great machines, 32 feet wide with uh, controls on the vibrators. They've got adjustable pans so we can put the, the crown and uh, even a, a variable slope shoulder onto the system all in one run. We're running with stringless operations so we don't, you can see there's no string, string lines here. So if people are able to move around a lot more efficiently. We're getting our mixtures better. You can see the finishing crew are having a real hard time keeping up. Uh, and again, we've got the system has got real-time smoothness devices hanging off the back. So the operator is able to respond almost immediately to changes as in the system. Uh, and so, you know, the contract is getting bonus for real smooth, smooth pavements. Uh, and so a lot of innovation happening in our equipment. Things that we're starting to look at is, is there a way we can mount some sort of uh, machine on the front of the paver that will tell us the workability of the concrete as delivered? In the stock in the pile in front of the pavement. What's the best way to do that? Because at the moment, the only way the operator can do is stare at the pile, take a guess. But if he's getting hard data, uh, he can um, tune the machine to the mixture that's being delivered truck by truck, and thus absorb the variability in those uh, between loads. Curing. The fine art of keeping concrete wet and warm so that it gets all of the hydration that it needs to get all the performance that we want out of it. It's a very cost-effective way of increasing the performance of your mixtures. Long, long ago, hessian, mud, dirt, sprinklers. Now we play, we spray chemicals onto the surface that seal it up. And again, some good work by Julie Vanabosch from Minnesota demonstrating uh, PEM, uh, EAM based products uh, seems to be the most effective at providing that curing. That coupled with the internal curing, uh, it's like uh, ice cream with cherries on top. What about testing and specifications? Slump, strength, and air. What do they tell us about durability? Absolutely nothing. Nowadays, we're looking at transport or permeability. We're looking at more effective tools of what is the workability of the concrete. Slump doesn't tell us. What about deacing salts? Are we able to resist their attacks? Can we measure shrinkage? Yeah, there are now tests available and uh, specification written to help us measure the things that really matter. That chart that I had on the mixed proportioning stage, the six critical properties, we now know how to measure them. For the workability, we've got the V. Kelly device measuring how quickly a hemisphere sinks in the concrete. Direct, numerical, uh, idiot-proof test that'll tell us, is this mix going to respond well to a vibrator, which is exactly what we need for a, vib for a paving machine. You can get mixtures with different slumps and different responses to vibration. Uh, and uh, so the slump doesn't give us enough information. Box test, uh, 
uh, a little subjective, but gives us similar information. Put it, make a box, stick a vibrator in it for six seconds and look for segregation and look for edge slump. This mixture was not great. We had to go back and rework it. Both of these tests, I think, are more suited to the lab when you're pre-designing things than they are for field acceptance. Calorimetry, the ability to assess the cementitious materials, the interactions of the admixture. We can prevent incompatibilities by tracking our materials as they're being delivered to the site. You can tell within a couple of hours that, oh, something's gone wrong here. It's different from all of the others. And uh, maybe we want to go back and see what it is that's been delivered. Unit weight, such a simple test. $30 scale, and it, can t it tracks very well with the air content until it doesn't. When you see a signal like this, you may not know what's gone wrong, but you sure as hell know that something has gone wrong. Go back, have a look at that batch, see what it was that kicked, added water, air void system completely out of whack, cement and fly ash substituted, aggregate left out, something's changed, go and find out what it is. Super air meter, again, many of, the, of you in the audience probably fairly familiar with the tool, tells us way more information than the air pot. And uh, that is a good thing for us. Resistivity, the ability to tell the permeability of the mixture uh, a lot more efficiently than we can with the rapid chloride test. Uh, and again, there's two different approaches. They give us the same data and they're both right. It's a lot more cost effective. It's very uh, operator insensitive. Uh, and you can retest the sample over and over again so that for a given mix, you can get a history of where it is at three days, you can start to predict where it's going to go at 7, 28, 56 days. Is this mix going to meet the performance that you're looking for? Other tests, we can use UPV to assess initial setting time, and that can tell us when you need to saw the concrete. I know one contractor in Australia has told me he saved millions by using an approach like this because he hasn't had to remove a random crack slab since he's been operating something like this. That's not trivial. Then we move to the idea of preservation. It used to be that we would design a concrete, throw it down, walk away from it, and hope it gave us 40 years. Now we're paying attention to what maintenance do we have to do? We can provide 40, 80, 100 years with a little bit of care and attention on our systems. Again, we had a series of presentations on CP Tech Center site of preservation, four weeks of webinars going into all of this in intimate detail. Feel free to go and watch those. So the future, smart concrete, putting sensors into the concrete, being able to measure the concrete as it comes out of the back of the truck so that the contractor knows what it is that he's dealing with. E-ticketing, leaving out the people so we can get the data into a database in a consistent form not only for day-to-day -day quality control, but also from research and forensics, is that when we come back in 40 years' time, when my students are old and gray, we will have data available for them to say, well, this is what they did right, and this is what they did wrong. One of the ones I think we need to pay attention to, and it's starting to get a little traction, is the vibration. Typical specs say 6,000, 8,000 VPM is the maximum. We know Going above that is bad. But I'm seeing states that require 12,000 VPN. It's horrific. But we've still got to gather the data to prove that it's bad. The little photograph, Peppa Pig, a British child's television series. Peppa's father is the world's greatest expert in concrete. And the reason he is that expert is that he has a magic wand that allows him to tap the concrete and tell whether or not it is good or not. I need a wand just like that, and I can be, be treated better than royalty, just like Father Pig is right at the moment. A lot of opportunities for us still to, to work on our measurement tools. So, the fundamentals, concrete from Aspden in 1824 has not changed a whole hell of a lot. Portland cement is still Portland cement. However, the complexity is increasing. We're putting in more and more ingredients. We're demanding more out of our pavements. We want to get onto them in four, in hours instead of weeks. We're curing for days instead of weeks. We're abusing our pavements with all sorts of 
very aggressive de-icing salts. And I'm okay with that because my son has totaled seven cars and I can't afford any more. So keeping him on the road is altogether a good thing from my point of view. But those de-icing salts eat concrete. We have to make better concrete to resist those salts. Our design life, it used to be when Brett was young, we were designing for 20 years. Uh, California is now starting to ask for 100 years. Now, it's pretty easy for old guys like us to say, yeah, we'll give you 100 years plus or minus 60, and we're going to be retired well before that is evaluated. The other thing is the knowledge base. It used to be within the DOT, now it's tending to be contracted. Life is changing on us. We have to change the way we do things. Again, a tall story, fill the time, although I'm actually short of time. This is somewhere in Europe. Um, we stopped to look at uh, one of the only concrete pavements in the city. And while we were standing in the middle of the traffic, taking photographs of this section, a car pulled up behind us and a guy got out and started shouting at us for questioning the quality of this piece of pavement. Turned out he was the contractor, he built this thing. And the loudest part of his message is that He's been building concrete for 40 years and he knows what he's doing, which was really intriguing because he only looked about 50. But, uh, you know, we're, we're, it's been around a while. We've done things. Uh, we often get pushback. I've been doing this forever. Why do we have to change? You have to do change because life is getting more complex. What do we get at the end of the day with all this innovation, all of this new education, all of this new stuff that we've got to get used to? It's going to last longer. It's going to be better. It's going to ride smoother. It's going to be safer. It's going to be more cost effective. We'll get better value out of our tax dollars. So as a researcher, as somebody trying to implement all of this stuff, I'm really excited. I think we can make things a lot better, doing better for the future. And with that, three minutes too long, but otherwise I'm done. Brett, back to you. I appreciate it, Peter. I really enjoyed that. Uh, now, Lauren, you got to help me. I'm looking. I do not see any questions. Whoa. I do not see any questions either. But, oh. Peter, you mentioned something on the inner layer. And I wrote that down. Mm -hmm. Years ago, we, we I think we were the first state to actually try it as an inner layer below a, uh, a unbonded situation with concrete. And... Uh, we started having issues because with prior to that, we relayed the one inch asphalt mix down. And uh, we had a project where it literally stripped out and was gone and the overlay looked like a punch out and it was completely gone. And we have noticed that some of our asphalt interlays do strip out, which causes a whole lot of havoc because you know the concrete's only as good as what it's sitting on. So uh, basically every overlay we do with concrete that's an unbonded situation almost everybody exclusively has gone with the fabric uh, the other little benefit for this is in missouri we're kind of unique we do alternate bidding so when we do a unbonded concrete overlay there is an alternative for rubberization and an asphalt overlay well when you do that if you're going to have a one inch inner layer that's asphalt if they're going to sell a concrete producer, the inner layer, that means they did not win the bid as the asphalt producer for rebelization. And the prices tend to reflect the fact that they were not happy that they didn't get the job. So between a little higher price than normal for the uh, asphalt inner layer and the stripping, we have gone pretty much, we allow the HMA, but almost nobody takes it. Plus it's much easier. You just roll it out like carpeting, keep the wrinkles out, attach Brent, it. As a user, have you had any negative effects? To my knowledge, we've not had any issues whatsoever. The very first one done, oh my word, can't remember the exact year, 10 years ago, maybe a little over. It's it's fine. And if you saw pictures of what we laid on, it was actually a road just on our side of the border of Kansas. In Kansas, and I heard this guy say this, that if they had a road that looked that bad, they would have closed it down. It was severely decracked. And uh, all we did was dug out the soft spots and then all the joints filled it in to get a good flat platform. And to my knowledge, the only cracking that we're seeing on it are on the ends where you get the impacts coming on and off the overlay. And I think there's a bridge or two due to those impacts. But get away from those, there's nothing reflecting through. So that, that is performing extremely well. 
And the only reason why we tried it was it was slated to have a lot of pavement repairs of all the joints and asphalt overlay. And uh, we were able to save quite a bit of money by just minor repairs in the fabric. And like I said, it's, I think it's 11 years old, maybe even older. And like I said, the vast majority of it looks exactly the way it looked the day we placed it. So we're very happy. That's good to hear. One of the questions I would have, you talked about filling the, the, the low spots or patches. Uh, what did you fill those with? I think they just filled it with a really simple grout. Yeah. Just, it, they weren't even looking for strength, Peter. They were just trying to keep it from locking up. Okay. Yep. It, between that, we just tried yep. to flatten it up. I do see a question related to PD, PDF of the PowerPoint. Would that be posted? And she is saying, yes, that's good. <laughs> you post these right. out there. Uh, and, I'll make uh, a PDF and I'll get it to learn. Yeah, and they're also going to uh, record this. And I think she mentioned this will be on a YouTube channel. And that I think the plan is to put a link where there'll be information about the payment conference, where that would have been. So you can watch this again or have others in your uh, who you work for, you know, say, hey, that was a good presentation on some of the newer stuff coming for concrete. Uh, take a look at that. Uh, let's see. I do have one more question here. Yeah, I just saw a pop up. Great presentation. Are there any harm if we apply too much curing compound on pavement? Never heard that one before. Uh, certainly no harm to the concrete. The only if you really slather it on thick until it wears off, you may have an issue with friction. The only issues I've ever heard with this is if you get way too much curing compound, it does make it a little more slippery. So when they're trying to saw in the joints, and that's, you know, we, a few years ago, we wanted to get our dosage rate more in line with industry standards. And that was one of the complaints that we'd heard from you that it would be slippery. But I think you're right. I've never heard of too much cure negatively affecting the concrete. In fact, a lot of the, the, the experts are saying um, you're better off putting two thin coats than one thick one. Same principle as, you know, when you're yes. painting at home to get decent coverage. <laughs> I think I've seen some states actually go in a perpendicular in direction to get that better coverage. In the last five years, that's become my pet peeve in Missouri is that sometimes our hearing is a little lacking it's a little frustrating because we spend so much effort and time and money trying to get good quality concrete and then you get to what i would call the least expensive part the curing compound and we can get skimpy on it uh, another question are other states using zinc clad bars and have they seen any issues with them I'll have to defer to Mark Snyder on that one. I think they have been used in test sections, I, but it's not something I've been engaged with. Yeah, I know I'm sorry, we've been pretty happy with our, our epoxy coated, so we haven't switched yet. In terms of innovations, recycling aggregates, what is the status of using blades from wind turbines for PCC? <laughs> That's, uh, I mean, that may be an inside joke, I don't know. <laughs> Well, I've actually been involved in one of those. We had a master's student who had a very miserable year. We, we got a blade and uh, he had a, a pretty hard time of trying to cut this thing up into coarse aggregate size particles. He tried sawing it, he tried grinding it. Um, and eventually we got, I don't know, probably 10 gallons of coarse aggregate out of this thing after weeks of, of effort, including, you know, PPE issues, because when you're, when you're sawing uh, fiberglass, the, the dust is not healthy. Uh, eventually he managed to get enough material and we made a, a collection of a few um, mixtures. Uh, Brett, your keyboard is going nuts. Um, I, I'm not touching <laughs> Aaron. Um, <laughs> And made some concrete and it was pretty miserable, is that the concrete does not bond to the fiberglass or the epoxy resin binding the fiberglass. And so strengths went through. So 
you know, the, the one thought I've had about using blades is could we cut them up to form plate dials? Suggested this to a couple of people in that world, but none of nobody's taken the bait yet. I think there is a possibility um, that uh, for, you know, making plate dials out of retired blades. Other than that, yeah, it makes a, a horrible aggregate. Don't go there. I'm not sure we've published the paper yet. I know the student's still working on that. This will be the last question. I won't mention the name, but I recognize him. What does UPV stand for? And can you discuss it more in terms of the saw time window? Oh, you're going to be going on, on a, a rack. Ultrasonic pulse velocity. Uh, it's this little device where it's uh, two sensors. One makes a ping and another one at the other end listens for the ping and we measure the speed of the sound through a four by eight cylinder. What we did uh, is that I had a student who spent a very happy summer driving to construction sites all over the, the country, oh, all over the state. It was a wide variety of states from city, county, DOT sites. He wouldn't tell anybody anything, he'd just arrive. He'd scoop a little concrete out from in front of the paving machine and note the time the machine went over the, that batch. He would then sit next to his car uh, reading comic books while this machine recorded the speed of sound. It pings every minute and just records the speed of sound. And what we found is a, a very, very good correlation between initial set and when the speed of sound starts to accelerate. And that's, you know, physically we can explain that. I wouldn't bother now. What he then did was that keep reading his comic books until the saw crew came past that same location. And what we found it was, again, a, an amazing linear relationship between initial set on the horizontal axis and when sawing happened on the vertical axis. Now, this was all uh, conventional sawing. We did it for uh, uh, early entry saws as well. And what we found is that um, you have to saw about 300 minutes after initial set. So the thought process is, is that you can set this little machine up, um, let it do the pinging, it will wake up and tell you when initial set has happened, then you can phone the saw crew and say, be here in three hours, uh, and it'll be about right. And this was independent of the weather, it was independent of the mixture type, uh, and it was independent of the thickness of the slab. Uh, and again, we've got similar data for early entry. So to me, it's a, it's a no-brainer. It's a three, I think a $2,000 piece of equipment. But if you want more information, contact me. I can give you papers and presentations on it. All right. I appreciate that, Peter. And we're past 11. I think you start exactly an hour ago. I thank everybody for attending. Again, thank you, Peter, for taking the time out of your day to, to give the presentation. Oh, oh, we got a question, but we're past the time, but it's, it's, uh, he must have woke up. I know this person too from the NC squared. So with that, we're gonna conclude again, the, this PDF will be put on the website and you'll be able to download that off the uh, site where the payment conference workshops information would have been. And again, everybody have a great day and uh, we'll talk to you sometime in the future, hopefully. Thank you. Thanks, Peter.